Hey guys, Creep the Lazy Geek here, welcome back to the channel and today I'm going to be talking about sampling, specifically undersampling and oversampling when it comes to astrophotography and what are the advantages and drawbacks of each of those methods. Also, we of course have properly sampled data, uh, but I'm not going to touch upon that too much because there's like no real disadvantage to that. Anyway, uh, the impetus for this video came from a previous video that I made about how you can really try to capture an amazing amount of details from the targets that we are uh, wanting to take pictures of. And that previous video is pretty much required viewing to completely understand this video, or you have already the base of understanding to watch this video, in which case you can keep going. But uh, basically, I'll put a link above to that previous video, also down in the description. Please check it out. Uh, so once we understand the uh, things like pixel scale or resolution, like the arc, the angle that is covered by each pixel in your uh, telescope plus sensor assembly, and therefore like how much detail each pixel can capture, you can understand that depending on your scene conditions, depending also to some extent on your exposure times and the way that you're doing imaging, also depending on your telescope aperture and resolution, and also if the telescope has a central obstruction, depending on a lot of factors, you can determine whether you are properly sampled undersampled, meaning that your pixels are too big or your focal length is too short or both at the same time to capture all of the details from the target that are available to you. So that's undersampled. Or you could also be oversampled, which means that your pixels are too small or your focal length is too long and you're basically, your setup is capable and is trying to capture details that cannot be captured for your current scene conditions. So there's two extremes. Undersampled, you're not capturing detail, details that are available to you, to oversampled, where you're trying to capture details that aren't really there to capture. And in astrophotography, it's actually much easier to be undersampled than to be oversampled. And the demands on your equipment are much lower when you're undersampled versus oversampled. So a lot of beginners, when you start with a small refractor and one of the typical cameras out there, like the 533 MC Pro, for instance, uh, you typically end up being somewhat undersampled. And for some reason, undersampling has always been, has very often been pictured as being something really, really bad that you should avoid. And I don't think that's true. Uh, just for reference, I'll put a link down below to Jeffrey, Jeffrey Horn's Astrobin. Uh, Jeffrey is a long time watcher of the channel, very long time viewer of the channel actually. And he takes amazing images, absolutely gorgeous astrophotographs with an, a widely undersampled setup, and yet the images are amazing. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the pros and the cons of undersampling and why it has such a bad rap. Let's start with the drawbacks. So what's happening when you're undersampled is that by being undersampled, you're effectively having a destructive process in that your target, the nebula you're trying to image, has a lot of details. But by, by being undersampled, you're not able to grab those details. And therefore, those details in your image are lost forever. You will never have any way to try to recover those details in the future. So in this meeting, it's a destructive kind of pixel scale to be at. If you want later on, to take a, you, you've taken your picture, you were wildly undersampled, and you want to try to zoom into the picture to go into the details of, let's say, the heart of the Eagle Nebula. Um, but because you are undersampled, those details are not there. They will never be there. You've lost them. They're gone, right? So that's like the biggest drawback of being undersampled and why being undersampled has, has such a bad rap. But I personally, rather than seeing it as a drawback, I see it as just a choice in that, okay, if your target is fits well into your field of view for your undersampled setup, and you're not planning on zooming into the details, you don't care. You just want to have a nice wide field of like the Subaru, the Pleiades, or of the North American Nebula. You, you want a really nice, nice uh, wide field image of it. It fits really well in your uh, field of view. You're completely undersampled, you don't care. It's just going to give you a beautiful image for the field of view that you like. And by the way, pretty much 
100%, maybe 99.99% of Milky Way photography that you see uh, is widely undersampled, and yet it looks beautiful. So another drawback of being undersampled is kind of linked to the destruction of details kind of thing. It's the fact that the stars will appear blocky. Basically, you have fewer pixels per star, so your your star might be on a single pixel, or it might be on like two pixels, and then maybe a, a bit uh, too above. It doesn't look great. But that's really the two main drawbacks. And let's talk a bit about a mitigation kind of method for both, and especially the second one is you can use a technique that's called dithering together with drizzling. Dithering, it's something I've also also covered in a previous video, I'll, I'll put like links above somewhere, but when you're dithering, you're basically moving your camera, your telescope, a tiny bit between each exposure. And by doing that, if you're moving by a number of pixels that's not uh, a, a natural number, so it's not a full number, by a decimal amount, then you can use a, an inter interpolation algorithm called drizzling to kind of like infer what the data in between your pixels was. And so you can try to recover some of the details there. And that's very useful if you're going to do things like deconvolution via processes such as blur exterminator. And also it will make your stars less blocky. So you can use this dithering plus drizzling method to kind of o overcome some of the drawbacks of uh, your undersampled setup. And in a way you make it the, you make the, the, the lack of details, the loss of details, a bit less destructive by using a dithering plus drizzling method. And there are some really good things about being undersampled as well. When you're undersampled, typically it means that your mount has to work much less hard to keep the objects in frame. Your guiding needs to be less precise. Often it means you have a smaller telescope that is easier for a mount to deal with. And if your camera pixels are large, which is often the case when you're undersampled, it means that each pixel uh, it, within a given unit of time will collect more photons. Each pixel typically has, typically has a bigger well depth, meaning it can store more photons to convert into electrons, basically. So it will take a bit longer to clip your stars. And at the same time, sensors with larger pixels tend tend to have a lower read noise, which means that you have more freedom with how long each of your sub exposures should be. You can typically get away with shorter sub exposures, even especially if you are in a light polluted area like in here in Tokyo. And by shorter exposures, what's happening is that if wind ruins one of your exposure, well, you've lost not so much imaging time. If your guiding was broken during one exposure, ah, you don't really care that much because the amount of imaging time you've lost is small. And because your sub exposures can afford to be shorter, you could even like to try to go without any guiding that can work as well. As long as your polar alignment is good and you have like your widely over undersampled, then very often you can uh, be okay without guiding, you still need some kind of method to do the dithering to move your camera in between uh, sub exposures, but otherwise you're golden. So there are some noticeable advantages to being undersampled, although it is like a generalization. You could have some small sensor, uh, some so small pixel sensors that have amazing well depths and uh, very small read noise. I mean, it's probably not very many of those sensors available, but it's possible it exists. But still, as a general rule, that's how it's working. So you can see being undersampled, sure you're like not capturing as much details as are available to you, and you will have no way in the future to then recover those details later on, besides if you've properly dithered and drizzled and done deconvolution. But overall still, undersampling is a perfectly valid way of doing astrophotography. And you can be undersampled completely on purpose as well because it's easier to deal with, less frustration, etc, etc. Don't be afraid of being undersampled. If someone tells you like you're undersampled, it's bad, you really should have like one, arc, one to two arc seconds per pixel, blah, 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 blah. Feel free to ignore them. As long as it works for you, that's all that matters. Okay, let's go to the other side of the spectrum. You're oversampled. So when you're oversampled, it typically means that you have either a very long focal length, 
or tiny pixels, or sometimes even both. Typically, when you're oversampled, it means that you have a larger telescope, so you need a larger mount to drive that. And it often means also that you have smaller pixels in your camera. Sometimes you can, you have like a kind of something in, in between. You could have a small telescope with tiny pixels, uh, or you could have a, a large telescope with fairly medium-sized pixels. There's many ways that you can be oversampled. But because you're oversampled, because when you're oversampled, you typically have like very small areas of sky covered by each pixel, the demands on your equipment will be larger. You will need to have better guiding. You will need to have better polar alignment. Everything needs to be better when you're imaging in an oversampled state versus undersampled. You really need to be on top of your equipment to have everything uh, well, well built, well made, well old machine to really make things work. And one thing to remember as well is that your guiding error, your guide RMS, uh, the root mean square of your guiding is basically almost indistinguishable from seeing effects, from atmospheric seeing effects in your final images if you have like the same amount for uh, right ascension and declination with the same kind of frequency. And you need to, if you want to, uh, to estimate the impact that your guiding has on how much it's blurring the images together with the seeing, you need to add the squares of the guiding error and the seeing, atmospheric seeing error, and then take the square root. So that's like the main drawback of oversampling is the demands on you, the astrophotographer, and the equipment, and the equipment are typically much larger so it can lead to much more frustration as well. There's some other drawbacks is uh, typically if you have like a very large scope with a long focal length, it usually means, most often means, that you also have um, a, a large focal ratio, meaning your telescope is not that bright or that fast. Uh, some ways to deal with that would be to go with uh, telescopes like RASA, for instance are very fast Newtonians that helps have like a long focal length while at the same time having like a very speedy kind of system. At the same time, if you're using small pixels to achieve your oversampling, typically, in general, small pixel sensors, they have less well depth per pixel, which means that your pixels will saturate faster. At the same time, typically, you also have a larger read noise and it means that you need to have longer exposures, especially if you're in a dark area like Bortle 2, Bortle 3 zone, you need longer exposures in order to be able to overwhelm the read noise with the shot noise from the sky glow. And so if you have tiny pixels with tiny well depths from a non-light polluted area, and you're trying to take long exposures to overcome the read noise, well, your stars will be clipped. You don't have like, there's no really optimal way of taking images there. In Tokyo, it's not really a problem. I can uh, overwhelm the read noise with like two second exposures <laughs> on my hyperstar setup. So that doesn't matter to me. But if you're in a dark zone, you really want to take advantage of that. And having tiny pixel sensors might actually be in your way of achieving that. Now, there are workarounds to that. You could, for instance, take the stars separately and then use processes like Starnet or Star Exterminator to remove the stars from your long integration and replace them with the stars that are not clipped from like shorter subframes, right? So that's one way of dealing with that. The biggest advantage of being oversampled or even properly sampled is that all of the details that are available to you, you've captured them. So you can play with that. You can reframe your image to zoom into the details of the core of the Eagle Nebula, for instance, whatever. You can see more stuff in your image. You have more freedom to reframe post-fact and, uh, and you can really go deep inside the image. And because it's difficult to do so, because it requires better equipment and more effort, typically on the type part of the astrophotographer, there's a lot of pride that comes and sense of accomplishment that comes with being oversampled. And being oversampled also means that you have the freedom to go ahead and resample your image later. You can effectively bin your image or resample it, take like um, squares of two per two pixels, so four pixels, considering them as a single pixel, and then basically 
s shrink your image. And when you're doing that, you're effectively increasing your signal to noise ratio by a factor of two effectively. So you can almost like have the benef benefits of undersampled systems while still still having the advantages of being oversampled, it's, except that typically, if you're oversampled, you also have a much smaller field of view compared to undersampled system. This gives me the opportunity to talk a bit about binning, which is basically a form of resampling. If you see your sensor is able to do two times two binning, it means that it takes four a square or four, four pixels and considers those as a single pixel. So that's especially true for a monochrome sensor. So what's happening, the monochrome sensor with like four pixels, consider them as one pixel. If your sensor is a CCD sensor, it can do that in hardware before the digitization of the pixels. It can, it has some advantages over a CMOS sensor where it needs to digitize the pixels first to read them out first before doing the binning, in which case it's not much better than any uh, software resampling later on. Binning for uh, monochrome cameras makes a lot of sense. Things can get really dodgy with color cameras. Color cameras might have different ways of performing binning. Some color cameras, when you do a two per two binning, they will take four pixels. And except that there's one that's red, the two that are green, one that's blue, they merge them together and it gives you a grayscale image. It works. And it's kind of like a fun way of achieving monochrome images. But there are other ways that binning can be done on, on color sensors that preserve the colors. You can use kind of super pixel methodology or some algorithms will also basically take like the nearest red pixel. So if you have a red pixel, you skip over one and then you get to the next red pixel and you have like a loss of spatial resolution that is considerable. But if you were very oversampled in the first place, doesn't really matter. It's just something to keep in mind. I personally try to avoid in-camera binning as much as possible. With CMOS sensors, in-camera binning is basically useless. The only advantage, as far as I'm aware of, for in-camera binning is to have smaller frame sizes so you can do stacking faster. And it eats up less hard disk space. So let's do a quick summary. We have the undersampling, under sampling, you're basically losing details that are available to you, but typically the demands of the equipment are much smaller. Uh, you have more freedom with how long you want to expose your subframes. It's a bit like it's astrophotography on an easy mode kind of. And then you have the oversampled where are properly sampled as well, where you capture the right amount of details compared to what is available to you and you have some ways to deal with the drawbacks of oversampling that are that have more demanding requirements from you, the S photographer, and from your equipment. And which one do you choose? Well, first, it's difficult to determine whether you are oversampled or are undersampled without knowing you're seeing very well. But which one do you choose? It really is up to you. For me personally, I'll just be undersampled whenever I do like wide field imaging of nebulae. But if I'm going to try to take images of a planetary nebula or um, of a galaxy, I'll try to be oversampled. I'll try to, or properly sampled. I'll try to have like small pixels cameras with my Newtonian telescope, for instance, as I showed in an earlier video on the M101 galaxy. I'll put the link up above and also in the description. So what are your thoughts on that? Do you have any remarks or comments about my explanation of undersampling versus proper sampling versus oversampling? Please let me know your thoughts in the comments while you're on your way there. You can like the video, you can subscribe to the channel. It really, truly, truly helps the channel out. You could also join my channel as a member or even better join my Patreon if you want to support me making more videos like these and more about astrography in the future. Every bit helps and thank you so much to all of my supporters. Uh, you truly make the channel possible. With that, as always, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.